Hi, and welcome to The Horn. I'm Alan Boswell. I'm recording this episode and all our episodes for the foreseeable future from home. We will do our best to keep The Horn running, bringing you analysis from around a region grappling, like the world, with a new reality. To help get on top of what this new world might mean, we're going to bring you extra episodes this next month. Usually we release these every two weeks, but we plan to bring you a weekly episode for the next four weeks, given how much there is to discuss. In the weeks ahead, we'll dive deeper into various angles on what the pandemic, the devastating economic consequences that are likely to follow, and an upturned world order will mean for the Horn of Africa and the countries inside of it. To start things off, we're speaking with April Jew. April is a journalist and writer. She's based in Nairobi, where she reports on the China-Kenya relationship, as well as urban inequality, human rights, and culture. And even before others started, she's been following the global spread of COVID-19 with an emphasis on how it may affect East Africa. Just a note that we are recording this episode on March 26th, And the situation is, of course, quickly evolving, so please keep that in mind as you listen. April, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. So before we start diving deeper into, you know, what this all may mean for the region in a more long-term sense, uh, what do we currently know about the spread of the virus in the broader region? Let's say Kenya, Somalia... Ethiopia and the two Sudans. So starting with Somalia, Somalia confirmed its first case on March 16th. And so, so far, it's only had that one confirmed case. But Somalia also doesn't have any testing capacity. And so almost immediately after that first confirmed case, the Somali government kind of immediately announced the suspension of all international flights for two weeks. So we're still in that period. For Ethiopia, it currently has 12 cases And it's important to note that there are certain parts of the country, uh, namely Western Oromia, that currently don't have internet or phone lines working because there's an ongoing military operation there. So that's one thing to note. For South Sudan, there are currently no cases. Um, But at this point, all of its neighbors confirmed cases. So It's unclear, but South Sudan has since shut its borders, stopped all international flights, and banned all mass gatherings. For Sudan, there are three confirmed cases right now, and as of March 18th, Al Jazeera reported that the government is preparing isolation centers near the border with Egypt. Um, And in Kenya, there are 28 cases now confirmed, um, and these cases are spread out all throughout the country, so not only in the capital of Nairobi. Right. And so I think what we're hearing there is that the virus seems to be making its way across most of the region and that there's a vast discrepancy in terms of number of cases, but, but a great uncertainty about whether or not that actually reflects anything regarding the spread of the virus or, or just the ability of the different countries to actually test it. Yeah. There are a number of theories about why this region and Africa more broadly has seen less cases uh, than elsewhere in the world. Um, Africa's much less connected to the rest of the world in terms of the sheer volume of movement. Uh, so some think Africa could just be lagging uh, the infection spikes elsewhere. Um, obviously, some people fear that you know testing has just been too limited to catch the cases. Um, and there's some early studies and suggestions that, you know, the virus might not uh, spread as contagiously above certain temperatures. So there's, you know, some that hope that basically Africa might be spared the brunt of the disease for climactic reasons. From your conversations, how are regional authorities and public health experts looking at these? Do they believe this is the, the calm before the storm, so to speak? Or are there still hopes they'll manage to avoid a massive outbreak? Well, I think the best way to look at that is sort of to break down each of those possible, quote unquote, advantages. Um, The first one of travel connectivity is that even though this delayed the onset of COVID-19 on the continent, it was um, maybe with stricter policies like the one we're seeing now a month ago, we could have seen this, you know, the disease being staved off or staved off importations at least. But It's here now. Community spread is starting in a lot of countries on the continent, not only in East Africa. So 
it's here. In terms of temperature, like you mentioned, there have been early studies, mostly in preprint, so not peer-reviewed, plus one that was uh, recently published on SSRN on March 19th, which do suggest that the virus is not as easily transmitted in warm and humid climates. However, it's important to note that these are statistical studies, not um, laboratory studies. And at the end of the day, there are so many other risk factors, which I'm sure we'll go into later, that may balance out this possible advantage or what might be working in the advantage of countries in warm climates. In terms of the risk that is posed by, for example, fragile healthcare systems, by uh, living conditions, it's quite, I, I think it's fair to, uh, to say that a lot of these uh, states need to act as if this is going to be, as if any of these countries could follow the same curve that, for example, South Africa is, the same curve of growth that we see in European countries, um, that we saw in Asian countries, and that we're now seeing in North American countries. Right. I mean, these are countries whose healthcare systems are already in many ways um, overloaded. Kenya, for instance, also there was the nurses who were expected to be on the front line were protesting because they didn't have the basic equipment to even treat victims safely. And that is, yeah, that's a really important point is the way in which healthcare services are provided in a lot of East African countries. Another thing to look at in terms of the fragility or or not also of healthcare systems is how they are structured. So a lot of the healthcare services provided in countries are not necessarily public or they could be funded in part by either foreign organizations or special funding streams that, like PEPFAR, for example, that only focus on one infectious disease like HIV or tuberculosis, malaria, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, it's a double-edged sword because even though the systems are structured in these sort of vertical programs where an entire organization or an entire program is just focused on HIV or just focused on maternity health, um, a lot of these programs, or at least I can speak for Kenya, have a pretty robust infrastructure when it comes to community level healthcare. So, for example, right now in Kenya, misinformation about coronavirus is a really big problem. Um, the Ministry of Health arguably hasn't done a good job of pushing out accurate information instead of just sort of broadcasting what is the correct thing from from their Twitter account or from, you know, TV or things like that. Um, a lot of the foot soldiers who are really doing the work of helping people understand are the same community health workers. Uh, they are the ones who, even in normal times, are uh, giving health care, are caring for, are uh, making sure people have medicine, are making, are, you know, they know who, who's disabled within a small area in their cluster. All of these people are still there, and all of those people have the trust of those around them. Those are what are pulling the weight when it comes to delivering accurate information about coronavirus right now, even as the Ministry of Health or as the central system is sort of trying to figure out how to get people to understand and do things. And so it's it's possible that in a lot of other countries as well, in addition to Kenya, that these strong local level or community level networks can actually make a big difference and can be an advantage. It's becoming very obvious that countries without enough testing capacity really risk losing control of this epidemic. And I know you've looked quite extensively at where Africa stands with its rating nest with those kids. We've also seen Jack Ma, the, the wealthy Chinese entrepreneur, um, he promised 20,000 testing kits and 100,000 masks to every African country. Um, ha have these found their way to the ground? And even if they do, do countries in the region have the capacity to use them? Uh, they did, at least in Kenya, find their way to Kenyan ground. The testing question is really, really important. And I think there's a lot of, there's sort of a gap between how people imagine test kits, especially, especially rapid test kits to work and how they actually do. So I feel like this is an important point to make. Um, and to do that, I think it's helpful to look at South Korea, which has sort of been this gold standard for uh, widespread rapid testing. And it'll help sort of explain why Unfortunately, that's not going to be possible or plausible 
um, in Africa without the without some kind of game changing innovation. So in South Korea, South Korean health officials summoned representatives from over 20 different medical companies, companies that developed diagnostic tests. The government um, worked directly with these, incentivized these private companies to start developing tests that would be able to detect what was then, yeah, novel coronavirus. So it was a very close um, working process between the government and these private sector companies. African countries and especially, at least in East Africa, I can speak, there is no capacity to develop and manufacture diagnostic tests within countries at a large scale. And so African countries, even though there is a certain extent to which, for example, the Africa CDC is able to, to just give some test kits to certain countries, I think it's on the order of thousands that's not going to be enough. And these countries are going to have to compete in a, you know, in, yeah, in an auction scenario, basically, with whoever can, uh, whoever the highest bidder is, unless there is some kind of um, intervention by, I don't know, by the WHO, um, et cetera, et cetera. The case of the donations of these testing kits and, and masks, um, it j- just was very notable also, though, because in Africa specifically, you know, it's always been Western countries who've really led the the development assistance um, to Africa on on public health. Um, are you seeing signs uh, more broadly or or hearing things from public officials that would indicate that this, you know, might, you know, uh, herald a new era in how China engages with Africa, but also, you know, how Africa views China? Yeah, so Eric Olander of the China Africa Project has written um, pretty extensively about this, uh, I guess you can call it PPE diplomacy, um, which is that, uh, by the way, it's important to note that this was an effort made by the Jack Ma Foundation him personally and the Alibaba Foundation. It was not a state action. But of course, the Chinese state media did cover it extensively, and they definitely took advantage of the uh, the good optics of this situation. The interesting thing that Olander points out is that even though U.S. and Europe have played a much larger role objectively um, in terms of supporting African public health programs, um, even outside of coronavirus. Um, you know, they're the ones who are actually pulling the weight in terms of funding that they are losing the optics game. They're losing the optics battle with China, especially when it comes to coronavirus. Um, and so this is definitely, in terms of perception, a big game changer. Um, also another space to watch how the, the politics, the optics of aid, um, especially as it comes to um, countries that already have an existing, countries in East Africa that already have an existing relationship with China, how that plays out. I would not be surprised if, especially in Kenya, which has such a close relationship um, with China in terms of its role, its important role as sort of an anchor for the Belt and Road, um, I would not be surprised if Chinese aid uh, begins to flow. I spoke last week with Dr. Ngozi Irondu, who's a senior research fellow at the Chatham House Center for Global Health and Security. And she was saying that African countries need to sort of come to terms with that reality and just be open about appealing for appealing for aid from China, not as a... um, you know, not as a not as a loan, or not as charity, but also just investment in health infrastructure, um, a long term investment in in what will be increasingly important relationships. At Crisis Group, uh, we're of course very concerned, as everyone else is, not just about the disease. Uh, itself, but about what the effects of a global economic depression might have on countries, you know, in this region. Does it appear to you that Kenya and, you know, other African countries you've been following are thinking as hard right now about how to respond to what are likely to be devastating economic consequences of this pandemic, um, as much as they're thinking about how to, you know, take public measures to try to contain its spread? I think what in Kenya is becoming more of an ethical quandary about 
and the same in the U.S. as well in a lot of um, European countries, this ethical quandary of how much economic hurt do we sustain, you know, in order to save human lives. Um, and this has become the heart of, I think, a lot of discourse in Kenya, and I imagine in other countries as well in the region, which is that how are people who depend on... Um, you know, on, on daily wages who don't have a social safety net, how are they supposed to adhere to social distancing measures? I think that what is important to to understand is that this is not going to be from a playbook at all because this is unprecedented. Um, it is unprecedented for all of these dynamics, all of these things to be happening at the same time everywhere. And so what how this will play out, the solutions that will be required of countries like Kenya are going to, um, yeah, necessarily be innovative and and look different than um, interventions have in the past. I mean, and, and as you mentioned, so many, you know, Kenyans and uh, not to mention uh, Africans and neighboring countries live very much hand to mouth on daily wages. Um, and of course, these countries themselves as you mentioned, also don't often even have the programs to funnel stimulus funds, even if they had them to spend, you know. And so other countries are looking at fiscal stimulus and, and sometimes ramping up programs that already exist, but in countries that don't have any social safety net to begin with, you know, how do you even go about trying to identify who to target with cash transfer programs if that's not even a program which existed before? Yeah, well, that's a really interesting point because it is and isn't. So um, yesterday in President Uhuru Kenyatta's address, he did announce that he was going to to do a cash transfer program to and it, and it was for and it was for a hundred million dollars roughly, which is not a small amount. Yes, a hundred million dollars to the the elderly, orphans, and other vulnerable members of our society through cash transfers, um, which he didn't indicate how exactly that would be done. So we might find that out in the next few days. Um, but this is a really interesting point because Kenya, through the existence of Impesa, which is uh, mobile money. Um, but more importantly, through the, you know, the high penetration of mobile money in Kenya specifically, there is the technological infrastructure for a giant cash transfer project. Um, if you wanted to actually get money to people in a way that is linked to, I don't know, there, you know, any number of uh, ways in which they interact with and use mobile money, you could um, whether or not there's enough you know, cash there to do that and how you would do that is another story. But I think this is also, this is a place where there are a lot of innovative ideas coming out right now that need to be paid attention to um, because as opposed to other countries in the world where social services have not really become digitalized, but in Kenya, you have this, uh, the possibility, you have the channel existing for um, what could become a a way to get money to people that could be an opportunity and ha has there been much thought that you've seen um, from Kenya or elsewhere on how to do social distancing measures that you've seen in in other countries in you know countries in East Africa where people you know many of the poor you know live really packed close to each other in informal settlements that's one of the cruel ironies of a disease that is transmissible that is so contagious and transmissible you know just by coughing and and sneezing is that the people who are most likely to uh to spread it or to be infected by it and to suffer from the disease are those who live in close the closest quarters you know in the entire uh in the entire country people who live in urban slums specifically um, and there are, there certainly are things that, uh, although they won't allow people to distance completely, will certainly stop or slow the spread. And these are simple things like making sure people have uh, water and soap to be able to wash their hands everywhere. Amnesty International was among a group of uh, international and Kenyan organizations last week that put out a letter to the Ministry of Health, uh, with a few pretty concrete um, suggestions, one of which was just to stop charging 
for water and electricity in slums. Um, for example, Kibera, which is Kenya's biggest slum and possibly the biggest slum in Africa, um, people forget that people who live there pay a premium on water. Um, it costs about 10 cents to purchase a 20 liter jerry can of water. Um, and I did some calculations. If my household, a four bedroom household, had to pay that much, you know, that unit price for water, we'd be paying over, you know, $100, $200 a month for water. But we get public piped water instead. So we only pay $5 a month for water. So people forget that the poorest, um, you know, people who are living in these urban slums are literally having to, you know, spend a lot of money to just access water. And so some of the, even if you can't, you know, force people to stay apart um, or force people to, you know, stay inside their homes, you can make water more available. You can make water and soap, uh, these facilities more available so that people who have no choice but to live in these close quarters can at least, you know, take action to protect themselves. From all the things that we've talked about thus far, what do you think might be the most critical action that could be taken, you know, soon that could help to try to prevent, you know, some of these worst case scenarios, you know, which is not just about saving lives now, but also in the future? If you're going by numbers, then we are all these measures that are being uh, implemented that are now being more strictly enforced, um, certainly in Kenya, are already two weeks, at least too late. Um, so long as there's already community spread, it's just a matter of, you know, trying to trying to keep this from getting worse. The healthcare system is going to be really, really overwhelmed. And so the key is going to be prevention. It's this um, a game of chicken right now between the state and between the people who it considers disobeying its orders. It, at the same time, the a lot of these states know that if they do heavily enforce a lockdown, so many people are not going to be able to feed themselves. Um, people are going to starve, and that is going to lead to social unrest. Um, I think the biggest um, solutions that we see right now, the biggest efforts to get people to stay home by giving them beans and rice and soap, for example, as a lot of mutual aid groups in Nairobi are doing, or to set up, um, you know, just publicly available hand washing stations. Like these small things are easy to underestimate, um, but these are all in the, you know, towards the goal of prevention, which at this point is going to be the, the most important, yeah, the most important factor in making sure that an outbreak doesn't get completely out of control. April, thanks for coming on the podcast and thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for listening. We hope you and your loved ones are all staying safe and well. Like we said, we plan to bring you weekly episodes for this month so we can examine this new world as soon as we can. You can find out more about Crisis Group and read our reports at crisisgroup.org or follow us on Twitter at Crisis Group. This episode was produced by Mae Francis.